51. Fifty-first Psalm. Psalm 51. Let's begin by reading just a few verses of the psalm. Verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Look at verse 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. What, what happens when a Christian sins? What happens? We know David is writing under guidance of God uh, after he has sinned and after he's gotten right. And he just tells us what happened whenever he uh, got right with the Lord about it all. Uh, and it, it, we would call it big sin. It was tragic. And yet God forgave him and placed him back in sweet fellowship with himself. Uh, so, but having said that, I want us to see the confession, or excuse me, consequences of sin and the cleansing of sin tonight. Always good for us to take a peek at Psalm 51. So, first of all, the consequences. What, what happens when a child of God, like David, sins against the Lord? Well, first, you find out that sin dirties the soul. David's praying, and he says, Oh God, wash me and cleanse me. Think about that. Here's a man who has his laundry done every day, dresses in the finest of royalty apparel, he sleeps on freshly washed silken bedding. He bathes in a marble tub with perfumed soaps, no doubt. Yet he, for a year, felt grimy. He feels dirty. Do you know that's how that's what will happen? If you're a child of God now, you if you are determined to live in sin, you will feel dirty. That's what the passage says. That's why he's calling to be cleansed. That's why we need to be cleansed. If you can sin and not feel dirty and grimy before God, then you're not a child of God. Because God does convict us and confronts us about our sins. So sin dirties the soul. Secondly, second consequence, sin dominates the mind. In verse number three, David said, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. My sin is always before me. Day and night, night and day, David is thinking about it. He can't get away from it. It's constantly on his mind. He's conscious of it all the time. Again, 
That's what happens with the child of God. God doesn't let us get away from it. You say, well, I did all right for a day. You might do all right for a day. But then you lay down at night and God, the Spirit of God will say, what about that? And then you, you say, I don't have it 24 hours a day. I'm not talking about 24 hours a day. I'm just t saying that God just repeatedly keeps bringing it back to our hearts. And it dominates our minds when we sin against Him. Just like did David. My, I acknowledge, he said, my transgression, my sins are ever before me. They're always coming up. I'm always being reminded of them that I've sinned against you. So sin, sin dominates the mind. And then all of that, thirdly, sin disgraces the Lord. In verse number four, David is speaking to the Lord and he says this, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Think about that against you and you only have I sinned against God David had sinned. Uh, you could I, I thought about it he has sinned in many ways he sinned against his wife he sinned against his children he sinned against his nation as a king. He sinned against all of these things. But primarily, he focuses in and he thinks about how that his sin was against God. Sin disgraced the Lord. And he's conscious of it. He, he's broken God's laws. He's broken families' lives. But preeminently, he has broken the heart of God. He has. And he's conscious of it. That's the consequence. We're mindful that there's something between us and the Lord. Fourthly, sin depresses the heart. Look at verse number 8. He talks about the consequences of sin and he says, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. He's depressed. There's no spring in his step. There's no gladness about him. He is absolutely depressed. You do know that sin... The Bible says that there's pleasure in sin for a season. It's thrilling momentarily, briefly. But David comes to the place that he knows that it's not uh, the, the joy, the kick has run out. And he says uh, there, he said, uh, uh, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Verse number 12. Restore. He's not saying restore my salvation. He didn't lose that. But he has lost the joy. It's no longer, there's problem. Conscience is aggravating. He's, he's constantly troubled. He's not enjoying life any longer. We'd say that he's depressed. Uh, so, the most miserable person on the earth tonight is not a lost person. Do you know that a lost person can enjoy sin? Yeah. I know it's for a season, but they, they can, but not so with the child of God. When you get out of the will of God, you start going the wrong direction. You can't enjoy it. God just keeps on aggravating you and whipping you and ch chastening us. And so uh, we become the most miserable of people on the planet. It's true. Child of God. For a child of God. So... Uh, fifthly, sin diseases the body. Um, you say, how so? Do you know that sin works on us? It, it works on us. Uh, there's a Macmillan. Oh, what's, no, what's his name? None of these diseases. A book, a little book that I've got. It just talks about all the kinds of things that the body does when you 
get guilty. And how the conscience works. And how the mind works. And how that it sets off triggers in your body. Having said that, everybody that's, sin, everybody that's sick is not sent because they've sinned. Okay? Don't misunderstand all that. But having said that, it's just a natural outflow. If you are going to sin, you're going to get guilty. And when you get guilty, you're, it will affect you bodily. It will. Uh, you say, how so? Well, how about an ulcer? Because you're worried. Because things are not... How about an ulcer? It's linked, directly linked with your emotional life. You said, could you have an ulcer and, and, and be right with God? Sure you could. We're fallen creatures. But I'm just trying to suggest tonight that you can be physically uh, affected by sin. Look what he says in verse number 8. Especially a child of God. It says... Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. That's poetry language. It is the language. He, David didn't have a compound fracture. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's got to get to the hospital quick because the bone's sticking through. It, that's not what's gone on with him. He's not talking about that. He is talking about that he's been crushed. It's like God squeezing him and he's going, crack, snap, crackle, pop. <laughs> it's Right? God squeezing him. And he's just using that kind of language to describe what's taking place. And it's affecting his, him bodily. God's squeezing the life out of him. And it's affecting him. I love the passage, Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. It's good for you. It's good for you to laugh. It's good for you to... to, to get enjoyment in life. Right? As long as it's in bounds. But when it's out of bounds, then it does something else. It goes on in that verse and says this, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. A broken spirit dries the bones. What's it do? It affects you bodily. You know, a person can grieve and they can get to the point that it, it will just drive them into depression. It will drive them to death. They so grieve. And that just has to do with emotion and thought. So, um, joy works like a medicine. Misery works like a poison. You've heard of psychosomatic illness and Psycho, mind, means by somo, soma, means body. The mind affects the body. And the emotions. So that sin could sicken the body. You do know that if you'll just strive to stay right with God... Keep things out of the way between you and him. Just keep the way clear. You'll sleep better at night. You will. You know you, you'll digest your food better. The gastric juices are flowing, right? <laughs> Do I go any further? <laughs> it's true. Th things are just functioning better. If, if you, you know what happens when you're guilty, when you're in sin, it doesn't have to necessarily be any kind of you know grief. That kind of thing can do this, but you say, "Oh, I just got to knot my gut." You do. It's like, it's like you're just all knotted up, and you just and it's because of, because of emotions and the intensity of emotions, and it comes certainly whenever we sin against God. Like David has. It's, he's got a knot in his gut for a year. And it affected him. So sin diseases the body. Sixthly, 
sin defiles the spirit. Look at, listen to verse 10. David says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. And he's talking about his own spirit and attitude. He has got a sour spirit. David has a sour spirit. Uh, you, you know that's how it works. If, I, if I'm not right with the Lord, and I know I'm not right with the Lord, I just dissatisfied with everything. And all of a sudden, I'm looking for something in Diana to point out. <laughs> why why isn't she doing that and you know and I'll start getting critical about anybody or anything and it's all because things aren't clear between me and the Lord you know what? When things are clear between me and the Lord, somebody can act like an idiot and I'll go, man, I love you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, man, you just, hear, you just hear him talking about you like that? I don't care. Give it to the Lord. Forget it. <laughs> go on. Instead of trying to pick at him and just bl somebody else want to preach right now because I'm getting under conviction I need the altar I think maybe <laughs> we've become fault finders you say how how do you know the, the spirit his spirit need, is sour well I remember that God sends Nathan the prophet and Nathan knocks on his door and says uh, King David I've got to talk with you for a minute. I've got a little story to tell you. And the story has to do with a fellow that was rich and he had a neighbor that all he had was this just little sheep. And the, it just, uh, somebody coming through and the king decided that he's going to take that little person's sheep and kill it and for this sojourner. And uh, what do you think about? Well, he will pay fourfold, the king said. Yeah, we're going to the nth degree. We're going to make sure that we get everything that he plus pay back. And Nathan says, you're the man, David. It's you. You've taken another man's wife. Now that then you had him, one of your soldiers, put in the front line so he'd be killed. It's you. But what's going on with him whenever he's not right with God? He's super critical. Isn't he? And judgmental. And pointing it out. That man, in the story, taking a little lamb. He had taken a wife. In the story, that man had just killed an animal. David killed a man. What happens? Sin. It will defile the spirit it will defile defile your disposition sour if anybody ought to be sweet on the planet ought to be God's children and it is always tragic when they're sour it's an indicator something's not right Number seven, we're still talking about the consequences of sin, right? Number seven, sin destroys the testimony. The, one of the worst things about David's life 
is found in verse number 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my son, uh, tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. He has been involved in adultery and murder, and now the whole kingdom knows it. God flushed it out. You can't sin and hide it. It always comes out. Doesn't it? And he the, is, he's asking for God to help him to sing again. Why? Because he's not singing. He doesn't have a song in his heart. He's lost it. He's got one, but it's the blues. <laughs> it's, not, it's not God's happy song of victory. He's filled with sin, and he's lost his song. Verse 15, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. He's not praising God. It used to be, he's praising God about everything. A, a backslidden child of God gets around somebody that's right with God, and they say, well, you just shut up. I'm tired of hearing you praise God all the time and thank God all the time. <laughs> right? Oh, you're thanking God about this and you're thanking God about that. And who do you think you are? I am tired of hearing it. <laughs> God's not tired of hearing it. He said we're to give thanks in all things. In everything. All the time. We're to praise Him. And worship Him. And brag on Him. But what happened here is that David, his sin has destroyed his testimony. His praise has dried up. His joy has dried up. Restore the joy. Uphold me with thy free spirit, capital S, not the small spirit where it was talking before about his inner man. It's now talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, bring back, I've grieved you, I've quenched you. Bring back a fullness of your spirit in my life. Bring back a joy in my life. Bring back a song in my life. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. That's to say that the whole year sinners weren't converted because they said, no, nope, I know about David. I'm not interested in anything he's got. He destroyed his testimony. No praise, no song. Testimony destroyed. So, all right, those are the consequences. Seven of them. Now, just let me give you quickly the cleansing. We, we can't stop by just talking about the consequences. We've got to make sure that we know that there's cleansing available. And God will help us. When we've sinned. You say God will just wipe you out and you'll be done. No, your, your testimony might be done with some people. That's a great danger. But God will always receive his children back. He's always working to receive his children back. He's always working. He wants them close. You say, well, you'll never be as close. I've heard that before. You'll never be as close as you were before. Not so. I know people have gotten, that, that, that have been silly in sin, and they're closer to God than they've ever been. They came back. God restored them. Now, that's no license to go sin. We're not trying to say, okay, you go, don't worry, just get at it, and then you, God will take you back. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, and, but there are a lot of things. The devil can use all that against you. To try to keep you down. And try to keep you from going on. So anyway. Here we have cleansing of sin. I note first that he had confidence. In verse, five, verse 1 of the, of the psalm. He says this. David says. He sinned high handedly. He says. Have mercy upon me. O God. 
according to your loving kindness, according unto the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, according to your, the multitude of your tender mercies. He's, he's very confident that God, he knows that he has many, a multitude of sins, doesn't he? David knows he has a multitude of sins. But here he is coming to talk to his heavenly father about the multitude of his mercies. You've got big sin. He's got big forgiveness. <laughs> he does. And you know what? David is confident of that. Why? Because he's walked with God for all of these years, decades, and then now he's come to this point where he's messed up and he knows he's messed up before. Never made you like this, but he's messed up before and God forgave him back then. He'll forgive now. He knows what God's like. He knows he's got a multitude of mercies for sinners and for backslidden saints. He's got confidence. You need confidence in God's mercy. And then there's confession. In verse 2 and 3, he says, Wash me throughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. David calls it my sin. He said it's my sin. He could have, he could have said, well, you know, Bathsheba hadn't been doing what she did. No, no, no. He's not talking about that kind of stuff at all. He's saying it's me. Not somebody else. But it's me. And I need forgiveness. What's he doing? He's confessing. And I'm glad. There's good news. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins. Homo logeo. To say the same thing. If we'll say what God says about it. If we'll side with God about it. Then God, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Water under the bridge, let's go on. He says. It's te technically sin under the blood. <laughs> Not water under the bridge, but you get my analogy. <laughs> hmm. We're confessing our sins. We say the same as what God says. We don't make excuses. Adam and Eve in the garden. Oh yeah, Adam says, is the woman you gave me. She says, oh yeah, is that serpent here. These are the problems. Not so. We just have to say, draw a little circle around me and everything else that's out there, I ignore and I focus in on my heart and what I've chosen against God. And tell Him all. And trust Him in His promise to forgive. Confession. Thirdly, cleansing occurs. You've been dirty. God, you feel dirty. God will give you a spiritual bath tonight. You, you need one? He can thoroughly do it. He says, wash me. Verse 7, he says, purge me. He says in Isaiah 1, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God will, uh, will, will clean us up. Before you know it, they're going to be calling you Mr. Clean. He's got the right soap, the right stuff. And then fourthly, consecration. Um, 
verse 12 through 15, you'll find there that there is a surrender to the Lord, a confession of sin first, but then a surrender to the Lord and to his service. He's really saying, Lord, put my feet on the right path. I want to get back to serving you. Look at it, verse 12. Did I say 12? Yeah. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and hold my free spirit. Then, then, when this happens, will I teach transgressors thy way? I'm going to tell sinners about you. I'm going to tell other backsliders how they can get right. That's what this Psalm 51 is. It's a testimony to backsliders saying, throughout all the generations, Look what God can do. I'll teach transgressors thy ways and sinners to be converted unto thee and sinners shall be converted unto thee. People who, saints and sinners that are not that unsaved, saved, unsaved, who are sinning against God can be converted, can be changed, can get back on course. Deliver me from blood guiltedness, O God, God of my salvation. My tongue shall sing Aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, uh, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. He'll put, put us back on track. The Lord will put us back on track. You do know that God doesn't cleanse us just so we can sit around and be clean. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> oh, with my little halo. I am somebody. I am clean. I asked the Lord for you. He forgave me. But you know, the, uh, the, there's something we call theological talk the sins of omission. You know what that means? Sins of commission. Oh, that's what I did. I did that. David said, I committed adultery. But you know the other sin? Oh, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I didn't tell any sinner or backslider the good news that there's forgiveness with our God. That Jesus Christ, God's Son's taken the judgment. And He is the Savior. And His arm, as we mentioned this morning, are wide open, outstretched, inviting you to come. Are we doing anything positive? When you get right, we should then want to serve and do the will of God, whatever that is, all that is. Steps in the will of God every day. Oh yeah, I got all that confessed up and cleaned up and I'm okay. But I'm just going to sit. No. No. That won't, go, that won't do it. That's not good. It's not going to, it's going to get you right back in the same ditch. Because there are things God requires of me. And I need to get at that. And you say, well, I, I didn't perfectly do it. But you ought to have a heart to want to perfectly do it. To do right. And to do what He wants. So, uh, that's consecration. Tonight. Consecration. Doing what God wants us to do. Thank the Lord. He's wonderful. He's marvelous. He's merciful. And He forgives and restores those who've sinned against Him. The great message of Psalm 51. 
Let's stand. Miss April, come if you would please play something. Before we go to the house, it'd be good for you to talk to him. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Lord, what do you want me to do to serve you? There's plenty to talk to him about. Lord, who is it that I could talk with? And pray for They're on a wandering path. Lord, would you please open the door for me to say something to them good of your good mercies and marvelous grace. Lord, would you send somebody else across their path? Pull on them, tug on them. Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Joy about spiritual stuff. Joy about our relationship with Him. Boy, I sure did get excited about the ball game. And that's fine. But it'd be wonderful if we get excited about spiritual stuff about our relationship with our Heavenly Father and our glorious Savior Jesus Christ the Lord have you had a sour spirit critical Might be because you're just not content and got a good relationship with your Heavenly Father. between my soul and the Savior. Look right up here. Is the Lord good? Yes. Oh yes, He is. He sure is. Nathan Coward, dismiss us tonight, please.